Hello, everybody. Uh, appreciate everybody's time this, uh, this afternoon. Uh, as as uh, Florence mentioned, Chris Wagner, uh, spine surgeon here in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, and in Allentown. And uh, I've been here for about uh, 10 years living in the Lehigh Valley. And uh, even in my, I guess, relatively short time, although it seems like a long time, I can't believe all the changes that have happened. Um, and if you look back and trying to go out to eat or trying to do things in the area, even 10 years ago, I can't imagine what it looked like when some of uh, you folks uh, moved in here. It must, this must just be totally foreign. Like, what are we doing sitting in this, uh, in this old steel field, right? I, can't, I, I just can't believe it. So really pleased to be here um, and to meet all of you today. We're going to talk about something that is very near and dear to my heart, and that's uh, spine surgery. Um, I really do like spine surgery. Um, there's a reason I went into this field. I love the technical aspects of it. I love the fact that it's always changing. Every year it seems like we're doing something new. Uh, it's, really, uh, it's really a great field to be in. And you're a surgeon, which is a great thing uh, to be. Um, and uh, I'm excited to share some of my interests with you today. So uh, we'll briefly go over some of the basic anatomy of the cervical and lumbar spine, mostly lumbar. The good news is almost everything that we're going to be talking about as far as definitions and so forth can be extrapolated to one or the other. Uh, most of the conditions go uh, hand in hand, so to speak. We'll talk about some of the basic pathology. I imagine you, know, you people are here to listen to me because you have had some back problems or you're having problems or you've had an MRI and you get these complicated MRIs and you hear all these words and you maybe don't have uh, such a great understanding of them. And we're going to talk about some of those terms and so forth. And then we'll go over some of the basic treatment options, um, which includes some non-operative and operative uh, options. This is a basic uh, model of the spine. The cervical spine is basically the neck, that's the upper end of the spine. There are seven cervical vertebra. Then the thoracic vertebra, there are 12 thoracic vertebra. That's sort of the mid-back, if you will. The lumbar vertebra, typically there are five of them labeled one through five. So if you have an L4-5 problem, that would be between the fourth and the fifth vertebra. And where it gets confusing is down here in the sacrum, there are five fused vertebra. So if you have a problem at L5-S1, that's between the fifth lumbar vertebra and the first uh, sacral vertebra. Here's a picture of where I did the, the final uh, aspect of my training, uh, which is the Mayo uh, Clinic. Uh, very privileged to have, uh, to have had spent some time there and worked with really some of the, the most special physicians uh, in the world. Um, at times I wish uh, uh, I was uh, back there, um, but it's great to be here. Uh, that is in Rochester, Minnesota. Not great sometimes. <laughs> Uh, especially in the winter. I, in fact, I, I look back at that time and, and I look back at my training and, and we, doctors talk about how horrible their training uh, is and how miserable it was to be up and not sleep. And I really dedicated my entire 20s are just gone. People say, why do you look so young? And I'm, pr trust me, I'm older than I look. Why do you look so young? Is because when you all in your 20s and 30s were out drinking and smoking, I was in a hospital learning how to take care of these problems. Uh, staying out of the sun and, and, and living pretty clean, sometimes not that clean, but mostly clean. Uh, and, uh, you know, we just never saw the light of day. And you think about how miserable it was and persistently and for the decade not sleeping. Um, and, uh, but I look back, uh, I just thought it was awesome. It was great. Some of the greatest times uh, in, in my life were, were, were at places like the Mayo Clinic and at Georgetown. I'm, I'm indebted to them uh, forever. So here's a basic model, again, where this is the lumbar vertebra. Most people have back problems. Some people have neck problems, but better than 80% of any spine surgeon's practice is going to be in the low back. People are always complaining about their back. So there are those five lumbar vertebra. Here is just a, one vertebra by itself. This is looking at you from the side, and this is looking up as if we cut you up like a loaf of bread. And you're going to hear some themes here, because I think the theme, the theme of the spine are you have these bones, and you have these ligaments, and you have these discs and then you have these nerves, and then you have holes. The theme is the hole, okay? The hole is, we need the hole to be big. The bigger the hole, the more room the nerve has to come out of it. So if your holes are small from run, one reason or another, then you're gonna have pain and disability from nerves, okay? So let's just start here, and I'm gonna talk about holes all day long. You can see the holes on the side of the spine here. Those are called the neuroforamen. And those holes, you want them nice and big because the nerves, they start up in the brain and then they come down the big hole 
the center, that's the central canal, the spinal cord and the nerves, they'll come down this hole, okay? So they're coming down from the brain down this way, and then they'll exit like branches on a tree through these other holes, right? And those other holes, anywhere you have pinching in there, if the pinching is significant, that's what's gonna cause the pain and disability, okay? So I'm trying to break it down into general osteology so you can see those holes. Here's some other pictures of holes, right? This, again, the main tube of nerves. This is looking at you from the side. You can see the bones. This is, again, the lumbar spine. It can be extrapolated into the neck. So there's um, all the, the, the lumbar vertebra. The discs are the cushion in between. They allow for shock absorption and motion, whether it's flexion, extension, lateral bending, or rotation, depending on what part of the spine you're in, certain degrees of freedom. And here are the holes. There's the main hole, all the nerves coming down from the brain, and then there are these smaller holes. They can hear in this called the foramen uh, intervertebral or the neuroforamen. And you can see if anything crowds this hole, okay, or this hole, whether it be a disc that gets weakened and herniates, goes back, it's gonna, it, it has the potential to cause pain. If the back of the disc here, forms bone spurs and these facet joints, maybe you saw this on some of your MRI reports, facet joints, if they cause, uh, if they get some, some uh, bone spurs, then collectively they will crowd this hole and cause pinching. And that pinching uh, can then lead to pain and disability. Again, all the holes, here are some examples. Those are those bones, this is the disc, this is actually a, a cadaveric specimen of a spine cut in half. You can see the disc here and this is, either a bulging disc or a, or, or a disc osteophyte complex, a lot of bone spurs, and it's just pinching. It's crowding these areas back here, and that leads to what we call stenosis. Stenosis, fancy word, just replace anytime someone says stenosis with pinching. That's all it means. You can have stenosis of your, your plumbing at home. There's just pinching. There's just not as much room for things to go out. So here are some definitions that you might see. Spondylosis or spondylotic spine. People see this all the time when they read their neck or their, uh, their low back MRI or their x-rays. Spondylosis, it just means a degenerative change in the spine. That's all, okay? Big word, doesn't mean much. Spondylolysis is a defect in one of the bones of the spine, usually what's called the pars interarticularis. It can happen, uh, we see that in, in, in older folks that become, can become symptomatic, that also can happen in younger folks. It's basically a stress fracture of one of the bones of the spine, usually occurring at L5. So there can be a problem between L5 and S1. Spondylolisthesis, big word, I seem to be the only person in the, in the area who can pronounce it, okay? Sometimes they say anterolisthesis or retrolisthesis, sort of defining the bones in the direction of the sliding. And all that means is one bone sliding on another bone. So if I have L4, should sit right on top of L5 if I go back. I love this spine, nice. All the bones are aligned, very smooth. But what if this bone slid this way? It would go like this, right? That's what anterolisthesis, spondylolisthesis. That's all that means. And so just picture it for a second, if you will. If I have a set of tubes or a tubes that line up one on top of the other so it all has to line up and have our nerves, our spinal cord, our nerve roots and so forth. If I have one tube here, one tube here and one slides relative to the other one, it's going to cause pinching. Okay? And that pinching is spinal stenosis. So common thing, a woman over 55, spondylolisthesis at L4-5, degenerative in nature and uh, they'll, get, they'll get stenosis and then symptoms that come from that. Probably the most common reason that, that we're in the operating room. Certainly one of the most common. Uh, radiculopathy, okay, you, we use that term. Normal people use the term sciatica. I just think of it as nerve pain, nerve pain that goes down the leg, technically below the knee. That's what radiculopathy or sciatica is. Um, radiculitis is just a, a, sort of a more generalized term for inflammation of that nerve. Neurogenic claudication, also known as pseudoclaudication, is when a collection of nerves from that central tube that goes all the way down, if that collection is sort of collectively pinched from multifactorial degenerative change, bone spurs, disc bulges, all the spondylolisthesis, whatever it is, sometimes people will get pinching and, and they'll get symptoms that'll make their legs feel heavy. 
They're going to feel like they have lead legs. They can't walk from where I walked. I can't believe that they didn't work this out better. So, yeah, you can't walk far. Sticking, so you can't walk far. You can walk a block, then you have to stop. You have to grab a shopping cart, whatever it is. That's your typical, what we call pseudoclaudication or neuro, neurogenic claudication. And then the other thing is myelopathy, which is, um, which is when the spinal cord itself is, is pinched. Everybody thinks if you have a big disc herniation anywhere in the spine, it's, it's going to touch the spinal cord. And the reality is the spinal cord starts at the end of the brain where the brain terminates, and then it ends around L1 or L2. So if you have a disc herniation at L3-4 or L4-5 or L5-S1, it has nothing to do with the spinal cord. At that point, it's just a collection of nerves. We call that the cauda equina. So the spinal cord ends at L1-2. If something touches the spinal cord, the spinal cord doesn't like pressure. It certainly doesn't like pressure that comes all at once. If you had a fracture in your neck and the bone slammed into it, you would have a catastrophic neurologic injury. But it can take slow pressure over time from these bone spurs. These bone spurs don't form overnight. They form over months, years, decades. And it can slowly compress the spinal cord. And then you get issues like your hands aren't working quite right. You can't button buttons. Your penmanship goes out the window. I might have myelopathy because I can't write a thing at this point. I don't know what's going on. Too many, too many uh, signatures. But, um, but eventually that people sometimes have a stepwise deterioration where they're not walking because the spinal cord is slowly being pinched. And it can take slow pinching, but you do see these little changes. There's more to it than that, but that's the ba those are some basic definitions that you may see when you see one of your healthcare providers. So the aging spine, what happens when we, uh, as we age? And I remember Sam Weasel, uh, who is the chairman at Georgetown, still the chairman of orthopedics there and very famous in his own right. Uh, he was a spine surgeon. And he, I remember ex him explaining things to a patient when I was a resident. And he basically said, the, the patient said to him, doctor, why, do I, why does my MRI look like this? What happened? Everybody wants a reason. What happened? And he says, he's, a, he's a, um, a man from Alabama, so he has this accent. He said, you see those wrinkles on your face? These are the wrinkles of your spine. And that's really what it is. Your spine changes just like everything else. We lose water, okay? When your discs lose water, you shrink, okay? That's why we're all shrinking every day, okay? We're all shrinking. That's why we're tallest in the morning. We lay down. The discs can sort of rehydrate. You get taller, you wake up, gravity pushes all that water out like a sponge. So we lose water. There's actually a change in the chemical composition, particularly in the components of the disc and some of the ligaments, which will re result in loss of your disc height. If you lose disc height, your, your spine was designed for you to be young. Discs are a certain height. Everything has its, every, it's like a puzzle piece. Everything fits perfectly. Well, once parts of those pieces start to get smaller, then the joints don't all line up. And then you get abnormal motion in your body, loss of cartilage and abnormal motion. Your body doesn't like this. It doesn't like that it feels loose. And so what it does is it starts forming bone. That's where you get those bone spurs. That's, and then you develop this spinal stenosis. The bone spurs is the body's reaction to abnormal motion. It wants to quell that that, react, that, that motion, and that's why you develop those, those bone spurs. There is a genetic component to it. There indeed is a post-traumatic component to it. All, the, all that is true, but most people, the aging spine, these changes will happen. I love this. This is from a, a real famous uh, article, uh, a couple of guys, uh, Kirkcaldy Wilness Degenerative Cascade, and it will either happen at the level of the disc, which is in the front, we saw that at the beginning, or at the level of the joints in the back. As we, we call the, the spine generally a three-joint complex. You've got your disc, which is its own form of a joint. You have your facet joints in the back. And if one goes, the other has to go, right? So if the facet joints go really arthritic and you get weird motion, well, that weird motion is going to be felt by the disc. If the disc goes and, and loses water and collapses, it, the, the, the motion is going to be abnormal. The kinematics are going to be off. The biomechanics are going to be off. And it's going to be facet, felt by those facet joints. So you can see this cascade. Um, that will lead to this uh, dysfunction and herniation instability and nerve root entrapment. So you got your disc. Sometimes it gets these little tears as we get older, as, as things get, uh, get aged, uh, which really leads to internal disruption and the disc gets smaller and then you get these bone spurs. Or you get the facet joints, which start getting some uh, weird mobility changes, degenerative, cap the capsule of the joint gets lax, the bones will start to sublux. Uh, and then ultimately this all leads to a poor quality of life and you see my, my, uh, my patient here um, 
ultimately sitting in the chair, okay? Um, but basically, this is a cross-section, uh, again, of the spine. You can see these big, juicy, healthy, full of water discs. And over time, this is what it looks like. And literally in the operating room, this is what we pull out if we're going to take out that disc and try to restore some of that height. Here is more of a cartoon picture of it. Again, disc degeneration with osteophyte. Osteophyte's just a bone spur. And you can see that there, a herniated disc. But in every case, all the, all the pathology, you can see it starts to crowd my holes. And if it crowds these holes, that can lead to significant pain and disability. Here's another picture. This is an MRI. Okay, real common. Trust me when I say we would all love a spine that looks like this. This is beautiful. Okay, this person's never going to have a problem for a lot of reasons. One, big, beautiful, full discs. The other thing they were born with and, and, and they were just blessed is a lot of space. This is, there's the spinal cord. Remember how I told you it, it ends at 1, 2, right? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, right? That, right at L1, 2, just like I said. And so the, spine, uh, the spinal cord terminates at 1, 2. And these are all the little nerve roots and the white stuff is all fluid. So all these little nerve roots are just floating around in that tube. That's what we want. Lots of just floating, no pressure. And everybody's born with a different size tube. Some people <laughs> were born with this huge tube. I've seen 79-year-old little old ladies that weigh probably 89 pounds and literally you could drive a truck through it. They could herniate the biggest disc in the world and there would be plenty of space. And then we'll get a six foot four, 280 pound guy that is born with a tube that big, literally smaller than a dime. And if you just took just a little herniation might crowd that, those nerves by 50%. Whereas if you had a big thing, this, the same herniation, it doesn't, it doesn't phase it. So, we can't determine the size of the tube we have. We can do things to keep our back healthy, but we'd all want to have this size tube. And this is an example of what happens over time. Disc degeneration, collapsing, and these, uh, these changes you see where you don't see. We want to see lots of fluid like you have up here. You don't see it down here in the low back. Perfect example in, in the uh, cervical spine. In this particular instance, you can see this is the tongue and the eyes up here. Here's the end of the brain, the cerebellum. Here is where it comes down in the, in, in the spinal cord. We see lots of white. That's the spinal cord just sitting there floating in fluid. It doesn't want things to touch it, preferably, right? And then you get these age-related changes with the bone spurs and the, um, and the disc protrusions and so forth. And you get no, there's no white, there's no fluid. It's, 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 it's compressed all the time. Here's an example of, uh, this is what's called a CAT scan. CAT scans look at bone. A lot of times people come with an MRI. MRI is great, looks at the disc, it looks at some of the nerves, it can, it can show pinching. But a lot of times we order a CAT scan, uh, a CT scan, to look at the bone. If I want to see what's pinching, is it bone, is it soft disc, what, what is it? I'm going to get a CAT scan. And you can see here, these are relatively normal facet joints. This is actually cutting us off like a loaf of bread, so I'm cutting it this way. This here is the center tube. So if we were looking at the tube, we just see nerve ends. We just see little dots. They just would be all those nerve ends. And in here, this is what facet arthritis looks like. See all these bone spurs crowding this canal? So this is pretty normal. This is definitively abnormal. This is a person who's going to have spinal stenosis. So sometimes we, we, we look at the MRI and we compare it to the CAT scan and we get an idea for, for what the spine is going to be like if we had to, had to do an operation. Um, this is a, a, an example of a disc herniation. Again, cutting you up like a loaf of bread. So they're showing you the level that they're cutting uh, this particular person. And this is the disc. So if we break the disc down into its basic parts, here's that tube. You can see the nerve just sitting on end, right? And here is the disc sort of cut uh, in cross section. On the outside is a t basically like treading of a tire. Okay, all these great collagen fibers that are perfectly oriented at 30 degrees and there's just layer after layer after layer of it. Probably just like you'd make a tire, just different layers of this, this, this very uh, dense material. Um, and then on the inside, the core of it is a softer material. It's a different kind of uh, uh, collagen. And so what happens over time, can happen acutely or over time, is you'll get these little tears <coughs> 
into these, uh, into these fibers. And some of that softer stuff can leak its way out or make its way out and touch these nerves. The bad news is if you have a real disc herniation, which usually happens in, in younger folks, 30, 40 years old. I've seen it happen in an 80 year old, but it usually happens in younger. Why does it happen in younger? Any guesses? What's that? Well, I think that's part of it. But the other thing is, old people don't have lots of water. They don't have these big juicy discs, okay? Their discs are collapsed. There's not a lot of disc material. They've lost the water, they've lost the cartilage, they've lost the, the, the collagen. So they don't herniate as often as your 30 and four year olds who might be also more active as well. But most of the people I see with disc herniations, they woke up and say, doc, I just woke up, I didn't do anything, okay? But uh, you can see some of that disc material coming out and touching uh, um, the nerves. The disc material in addition to causing a compression of the nerves also has a noxious stimuli in it. Okay, there are chemicals in it, which I call it like bee sting material. It just pisses off your nerve, okay? <laughs> Some worse than others, but it can hurt a lot. Um, believe me, I've seen many, many, I've done thousands of disc operations, and you can almost tell what level, what side, where it is based on how, how, what it looks like when they come in, okay? Uh, this, these, these can hurt. They can hurt a lot. How do we treat most low back pain? Rest and activity modifications, uh, anti-inflammatories. If you look at the, the most recent recommendations, this is, this is what they want you to do. They want you to do massage. Uh, if you have back pain, they want you to do massage. They want you to do physical therapy. Um, rest, but not too much rest. The next step might be a little bit of physical therapy or a little bit of anti-inflammatories, but not Tylenol. They decided Tylenol doesn't work for back pain. Chiropractic care, everybody walks in thinking I hate chiropractors. I don't know, you know, I, I guess a lot of surgeons hate chiropractors. I don't. I think our chiropractors are great. Yeah. I've used them, um, and I think they do a real nice job. They're not doing a lot of these high velocity, you know, break you in half kind of maneuvers, but I've had a lot of success. I use them, so I think you should consider that as well. Injections. I'm not going to talk too much about injections, but I think they help, okay? And it doesn't matter if they help because in most instances, you have to get them before you get surgery because the insurance company will deny it if you don't get it. So let's not have the argument. I, I spend most of my day arguing with people about why I won't operate on them and why they need to try this or that, okay? But that is the standard of care. I believe in the standard of care. And it's not up to you, it's not up to me, it's up to the insurance company, okay? Now, there are circumstances when we don't have to worry about the insurance company, but I think injections work. I've had them in I've, epidurals. I've had them in my back. They're not awful. I don't think of it as a Band-Aid. I think it can help your own body's response to get you through this episode of, of pain. Fenestrative procedure. All that means is we make holes, okay? Your hole is small. The nerve is being pinched. We make it bigger. That's what a fenestrative procedure. A microscopic discectomy is a, essentially a fenestrative procedure. A laminectomy, I don't do a lot of laminectomies. I, I do more fenestrative procedure, making a hole here and a hole here, and I sort of rotor rooter out the area. I don't, laminectomy is, uh, is an old man surgeon operation, but there's a place for it. Some people love them, I just, I just don't do a whole lot. I do more hemilaminectomies. Um, Laminoplasty is another procedure. All these procedures, everything a spine surgeon does, breaks, it's very simple, two things. We make the holes bigger for the nerves or we knit the bones together. There's really two, that's gotta be 95% of what spine surgery is. So if you don't have a hole to make bigger because you don't have any pinching or you don't have any bones that need to be knit together that is gonna solve your problem, then you aren't gonna benefit from spine surgery, I promise you. Okay, so those are the basic things and those type of things led to this minimally invasive surgery which I have a professional interest in um, and when it's applicable, when I think we can use it, when I think you'd benefit from it, when I think the risks outweigh uh, or the benefits outweigh the risks, I think it's a, a, a great idea and I certainly have done a lot of it, more than anybody by a lot um, in the area and, and anybody that I know. This is the old way. The old way is a laminectomy, okay? Let's break it down. Here is the tube. Again, cutting you like this, right? 
and then flipping that on end, and you see here's the disc, okay, different orientation than before, and here is the tube of nerves with the nerves just floating around. So if I have it like this, and this is really tight, okay, if I cut it here and cut it here and I open it up like this, it's going to make more room. If I take away all the bone, and a laminectomy means we're just taking away the lamina. If this roof was coming down on all of us and we were all nerves, and I cut a hole there and I cut a hole here and remove the nerves, we could all stand up tall. That's all it does. And people think, well, do I need the lamina? Well, it was there for a reason, um, and it would be nice if you had it, but you don't need it, okay? You really don't, you don't need it for most people. You can't take away the whole lamina of the spine because it does have ligament attachments and muscular attachments and keeps us upright. But for a few levels, um, you can take away the lamina. Just like, just like the surgical, um, this is from a surgical technique guide on how to do a laminectomy. We're basically just taking the roof off. That's it, real simple. The benefits of minimally invasive surgery are less pain, less bleeding, fewer infections, shorter hospitalization, improved results and earlier return to function. Something I think most people, if it was an option, they would want that. I'll show you how I would do a basic uh, minimally invasive decompression. Here's some of the basic tools that, that I would use. These are the tubes, but there are various, um, various lengths, various diameters, and basically you could see how we set it up, how we localize here's the, the, the spine, that's the level we want to do the procedure, and we take a dilator. So you make a small incision, and I would take a dilator, so uh, a, a solid uh, tube, and put it down on the le level. You can see the lamina there, or a portion of the lamina, and there's the disc herniation. And then I would take successively larger tubes and place it over the solid tube, and then place a tube down, just like this. You see that tube sort of directed like a sniper. And you can see the dilator there, and that's a little piece of disc coming out there. Tough to see. You can go on YouTube and watch me pull some discs out. And here's what it looks like. This is just another procedure, again, through the tube. This is, would be a fusion where we're taking out using tools to extract the disc material and placing in. Here's the old way, and uh, you can see, uh, and here's some of the newer way. And by the way, there's, there's not a whole lot wrong with the old way. The guy across the street's doing it the old way. I don't have a big problem with it. Some people need the old way. That's just the way it is. I've done enough minimally invasive surgery to know when you have to actually do a traditional procedure. Sometimes it's a better idea, okay? And I think at the end, um, for some of those procedures, at the end of the day, um, a lot of those patients are gonna do great. It doesn't mean you're gonna have a bad result, there, but there are some alternatives. So we talked about the pros, the cons, limited indications. You have to look at how many levels you're gonna look at. Is it just a four or five problem? Is it a L1 to S1 problem? Maybe that's not a great thing. Body habitus, level of deformity. What is the surgical risk? Can we even put this person in a prone position? Uh, so the old way, we used to, when I used to do these over at Muhlenberg, they were in the hospital for four or five days. We used to do, and it was incredible. Um, took a couple of days before they were off walking. They needed IV pain medication. The new way, if it's three days, that would be a lot. It's more like two days. We're really walking the next day, limited IV pain medication, and improved function. Again, on the old way, I said improved function and decreased back and leg pain. The same thing happens. Just because you have it the old way doesn't mean it's not going to work. So the indications for surgery, we don't operate on everybody, right? I want you to fail non-operative treatment. If you're, you got to try it. Non -op failure of non-operative treatment for 6 to 12 weeks, progressive neurologic dysfunction. Yesterday I could move my arm, today I cannot. A focal neurologic or a functional neurologic deficit, I can't lift my arm so I can feed myself or brush my hair or do what I need to do at my job. If you have incapacitating pain, and there are certainly some other reasons. Anyway, it's a great alternative to, tr to traditional uh, spine surgery. Um, the benefits uh, for patients can be those that we've discussed. Um, I think the outcome are similar to those open procedures. Uh, I do appreciate your time today. I'll be sticking around for a few questions here, and then I will go over to the booth if you have any uh, questions. We're in 101. Apparently, it's the big booth with all the orange and the black. Um, I appreciate your time. Thank you.